Well, praise the Lord. What a joy to be in Pahokee this morning. Wow. And uh, happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. I appreciate you today and appreciate the opportunity to come. Thank you, Brother Graham, for letting me come. Always a, an honor to stand behind this pulpit and preach in this church. I love you. And uh, we were reminiscing uh, yesterday a little bit, Brother Graham and I, and I preached in the, in the fellowship hall before they ever finished this building. And uh, so I, I've, I've got a history here. I'll go back a, a few days anyway, and we are delighted to be back again. We do need your prayers. We don't know if we're going to go to Nicker or not. We're, we're trying to get there, but we don't know with all the regulations and the emails, and we're not getting answers or nothing like that. So we're just going in faith. Hallelujah. And we're just going to believe that God's going to help us get on that plane and get the work done. And uh, I appreciate God this morning. You know, I'm sitting there thinking my, my dad died when I was two years old, so I never really knew him. I don't have any recollection of my father at all. Um, but through that, all of that, God still gave me a father. When I got saved, the, the, the lady that won me to the Lord, her husband became my dad. And uh, he's gone on to meet with the Lord now. But what an example of God he was to me. And uh, I look across this audience. I thought as Sister Melody said, she had a good dad. She had a good dad. And Brother Graham had a wonderful dad, and we they're just wonderful men of God. And I, uh, so I appreciate Dad this morning. But as I was sitting there, what came to me was the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus said for us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. As I began to think about that this morning, you know, thank God for our earthly fathers, but thank God for our heavenly Father. Because they're different. They're alike, but they're different. They're alike in that the Father takes care of you and our Heavenly Father takes care of us and our earthly Father took care of us for the most part. And that's alike, but there's that's a similarity. But the part that's not alike is that God is totally different in a lot of ways than our earthly Father. For instance, our earthly Father couldn't be everywhere at the same time. But our God is omnipresent, hallelujah. He's everywhere, so he can take care of me no matter where I am or what I'm going through. God is there. And then our earthly father, thank God, he didn't know all about us all the time. Some of us are happy about that, amen, because we probably did some stuff we weren't proud of and we didn't want him to know about. But our heavenly father, he's omniscient. He knows all about us. Everything we've ever done, thought, or gonna do, God knows about it, amen. And that's, that's a wonderful thing when you think about it. God knows the end from the beginning, and he's making a way. And, you know, we were talking in Sunday school about the early church this morning. God orchestrated all of that. He brought them together when? On the Feast of Pentecost, when he knew that they were going to be devout men from all over the world were going to be there. God fixed it. He knew because he's omniscient. And then, I like this one the best. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. So that means that no matter what I need this morning, God is able to supply that need. Amen. Sister Wilda, if it's comfort, then our God is able to supply that comfort. If it's a miracle, then our God is able to, to work miracles. Whatever we need this morning, church, God is able to meet that because he is the omnipotent God, the Holy One of Israel. And I, I love him this morning, and I love you, and what a joy to be here. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to make a couple of stops this morning. The first one is going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, and then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 12. 1 Chronicles chapter number 15, we're going to read verses 1 and verses 2 there. Men, I want to say to you this morning that you are far more important than you realize. Amen. You are far more important than you realize. And we need to understand that this morning. First Chronicles chapter number five. Now, if you're a real Bible scholar, when I say first Chronicles five, you shudder. Because the first nine chapters of the book of First Chronicles are nothing but so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so ad infinitum. It just goes on for nine chapters. Well, I'm going to jump in the middle of that, and we're going to read a little bit of that this morning. First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. First Chronicles chapter 5 and verse number 1. It says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. The firstborn of Israel. Then notice 
There's a parenthesis there. So he's just going to make a little parenthetical statement here, but it's very, very interesting and instructive. Notice, for he, talking about Reuben, was the firstborn, but, pero, pero, the but here is not good. For as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. He lost his birthright. Think about that. We're going to talk about that. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright, for Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, And but the birthright was Joseph's. Now, let me explain that a little bit. He's saying, look, the birthright doesn't come uh, because of, the, of your genealogy, but the birthright came because you were the firstborn. He sacrificed his or gave it up. And so what happened there was Joseph received the birthright, but Judah received the blessing of the Messiah coming through his lineage. That is a, a, a simple explanation of what he's talking about there. And we're going to come back to that. Now, Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter number 12, we're going to read just one verse there, verse number 29, very interesting verse. It has a lot of different interpretations. I'm going to use it my way this morning. Brother Wayne, I'm preaching, so I'm going to preach it my way, okay? Amen. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 29, Jesus speaking, and he said, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first do what? Bind the strong man and then, and then what? After he binds the strong man, what's going to happen? He will spoil his house. Very interesting verse there. He will spoil his house. If the Lord will help me, I want to talk to you about that. Don't let him spoil your house. Don't let him spoil your house. Amen. Would you ask him to help us, Father? What a joy and a privilege and honor to be in your house today in Pahokee, Florida, Lord. Thank you for Good Shepherd. Thank you for Brother Chancey and Sister Melody and the girls. Thank you for these wonderful people that we love so dearly, Lord. Thank you for the privilege to stand again, God, and preach the word of the living God. Oh, I thank you for your presence that I feel in this house today. I know some are gone on vacation. Others are busy in the work of the Lord, but we're here, God, and you have a message for us, and we we pray that you'll come and move in a mighty way, that you'll anoint us, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive the word of the living God. Move in a mighty way around this altar, Lord, and touch every one of us, not just fathers, Lord, but all of us, we need your touch today. And we ask you to move in a special way and minister in that to every heart. And we'll give you praise, honor, and glory. Ask it all in Jesus' name. And all of God's folks said amen. And amen. You may be seated this morning. Don't let him spoil your health. Well, fellas, I hate to tell you this morning, but sometimes being a dad is a thankless job. It is. Amen. I mean, it's getting to go anywhere you want to go on Father's Day and getting to pay the bill. <laughs> amen. We get to pay the bill. We can go wherever we want, but we got to pay the bill. It's getting up in the middle of the night to investigate the noise outside when you'd rather stay in the bed and hide like everybody else. <laughs> Amen. It's playing Santa Claus on midnight on Christmas Eve only to pay for that privilege for 36 months at 22% interest. It's uh, putting toys together that the instructions say only take a screwdriver, <laughs> but then it takes a master mechanic <laughs> to finish the job. 
a rocket scientist or, or a, uh, whatever to finish the job. It's praying and anxiously looking forward to the time when your kids are raised and they get out of the house and get on their own. But uh, as that day approaches, uh, you try to put that day off uh, as far as you can. And I only had one of them, and it was hard to give her up. Think about that. It's carrying sleepy kids into your house when you're so tired you can barely, barely carry yourself. That's being a dad. That's being a good, good father. Think about that. It's fixing kites and breaking up fights and wiping up milk chocolate. Hallelujah. Amen. Dads have a tough job this morning. It's your job to protect your family and provide for your family and to raise your children. And the hardest part of that is to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of God. And I just came by to tell you that that job is getting harder and harder as we go toward the end time. It's not going to be easier to be a dad in the future as it has in the past. And dads, we're going to need God's help more now than we ever have in all of our lives. Amen. Think about that. We need the Lord to help us this morning. America is finding out the hard way that dads are much more important than they ever dreamed that they should be. Think about that. And that they're given credit for. Oh, in our generation, uh, now for many years, uh, men have been castigated and portrayed as bumbling idiots uh, who didn't even have enough sense to come in out of the rain. Uh, we've gone from Father Knows Best uh, to Bart Simpson and, uh, and Homer Simpson. Think about that. In one generation, uh, we are ridiculed and mocked and laughed at and, and degraded in this society. But America is finally finding out the hard way that men are more important than Hollywood portrays us. Oh, yes, they are. Hallelujah. And so we, we need to understand that. There is no doubt about it that manhood is under attack in our society this morning, and biblical manhood is hard to find. Very, very hard to find. And because of that, something bad is happening. Society is coming apart at the seams. You see, what America needs and the world needs is stronger dads. What America needs and the world needs is spiritual dads. Because we could take care of a lot of the problems that we're facing if we just had good dads or spiritual dads or both. Think about that. Hey Amen. Listen to this. We are far more important than you realize. Listen to these stats. When a mother is the first person in the family to come to faith, the rest of the family will follow her 17% of the time. When a child is the first person to come to faith in the family, the rest of the family will follow that child 31% of the time. But when the father is the first one to come to faith in her family, their family follows them 93% of the time. Do you realize by that... What a great influence men have on their families. Amen. We have much more power and influence and effect on them than we even realize. And so, men, we need to be good dads this morning. We need to be godly dads this morning. We need to do whatever God has called us to do because we exert extreme power and authority over our families. And so, much of us, we don't, we don't even realize that. Society doesn't realize that at all. The Department of Justice, I thought this was interesting. This is a quote. The greatest predictability of criminal behavior in, is the absence of a father in the home. In other words, if dad is gone, everything goes downhill. Think about that. If there's no father figure in that home, Brother Moses, everything is going to go bad. Everything's going to go south. Everything's going to go downhill. So fatherless homes are killing our society today. Father Fatherless homes are destroying America, and we don't even understand that. This was very interesting and sad to me. The, uh, do you know how they decide on how many prison cells to build in America? Blew me away. You know, you always wonder, well, how, how do they figure out how many to build? Here's how they do that. They look at sixth grade boys. Sixth grade boys. They look at three things. Number one, they look at their reading scores. They look at their math scores and they look at whether or not there's a father figure in their house. If their reading and math scores are low, then the next thing they look at is, is there a father present in that home? And if there's not, 
You know what they do? They build that sixth grade boy a prison cell because they know that the probability is extremely high that one day that sixth grader is going to end up in prison. And it's all because he didn't have a father influence in that home. Man, when I read that, my heart broke. I thought, oh, God, you mean we've come to the place where we're building prison cells for sixth graders because dad has been absent, amen. And so guys, let me tell you, we, we wield a lot more power than we even imagine. Just your presence in a family can stop a whole lot of trouble. And then if you add to that being a godly, holy, spiritual man, I'm telling you this morning, gentlemen, you and I can make a difference in our generation. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I want to make a difference. I don't want to come to the end of my life and having done nothing to change my society. But God said just by being a, a man and being a father and being there when my family needed me is going to help tremendously, but being a spiritual dad is going to help even more. So I'm telling you this morning, I want to be a spiritual man. I want to be present. I want to be there, and I want to make a difference in this world. Hallelujah. And gentlemen, God has given you and I that privilege and that honor and that ability to make a difference in this world. Hallelujah. And so we, we, we can do that if we want to. Now, here's the problem. Today, the devil is making an all-out attack on the family. See, the family is the basic building block of society, so the devil knows if he can destroy the family, then he can literally destroy society as a whole. And so the devil is making an all-out attack to try to, uh, uh, to destroy the family, and especially dads, because he knows if he can destroy the family, then everything else is gonna be lost. Now, in our text in Matthew, Jesus seems to give us here at least a hint of how the devil works against the family in, our, in, in, in this generation. Notice what he says carefully. Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then after he's bound, he will spoil his house. And so Jesus here is saying that here is a strong man living in his house, but he has an enemy. And that enemy has a plan, and that plan is to spoil that man's house. See that? So Jesus here, in my opinion, is showing us, gentlemen, that we are public enemy number one to the devil. Notice he didn't say if a strong woman keeps his house, but a strong man. See that? And so, gentlemen, we are far more important than we realize. And the devil knows that. And so the devil has come after men. That's why Hollywood, who is backed by the devil, amen, depicts men as sissy boys and, and all of that and demeaning them in our generation. It's the devil's plan to try to destroy the family. And if he can destroy the family, he can destroy our very society. And so the word spoil there means to plunder or to seize control of. That's what the devil has come to do, to steal, kill, and destroy, to plunder and to seize control over our families. And he's coming at you and I, Dad. He's coming at us first. Come on, amen. He's coming at us first. That's why we need dads today that are spiritual men and powerful men and prayerful men because the devil is coming after us first. Amen. God put us in charge. God made us the head, and the devil knows that. So, Dad, you're the strong man, and the enemy is the devil, and he wants to spoil your house. Let me shout it this morning. Don't let him spoil your house. Whatever you do, don't let him spoil your house. Now, if you look at this closely, you can see that the only way the devil can plunder and control and seize your family is if he binds the father, the dad. Isn't that amazing? The only way he can take over your family is if he binds the father in that family. Wow. <laughs> he's, he's doing that. He's doing that. The devil is going to do his best, gentlemen, to bind us. 
Think about that. The devil is going to do everything in his power to bind us as the leader of that house. And there are three things that I, I want to talk to you about this morning, three ways the enemy will use to bind us up, gentlemen. There's hundreds of them, but I'm just going to name three of them that are very powerful and potent in our generation. He destroyed Reuben and his family through lust. Through lust. And Reuben, in our text, the Bible tells us he was Jacob's firstborn son. Now, in that generation, that was huge. That was huge. Man, the firstborn, he had way more privileges than the rest of the siblings. Come on, amen. I mean, it was an honor and a privilege and a blessing to be the firstborn son. So that was huge in his day. And the firstborn received a double portion of the inheritance. In other words, if there were five youngins, they divided the inheritance up six ways and the firstborn got two of those inheritances. He got a double blessing and so he was automatically by default richer than anybody else in his family. Second and more importantly in that generation at least was when the father died, the firstborn became the spiritual leader of that whole family, the whole clan. Amen. Man, that was huge in that day. I mean, to be the spiritual leader was a heavy weight. I want to tell you, folks, uh, that God has made you and I as fathers uh, to become the spiritual leaders in our family. Uh, and I, I look around the world, and I'm not seeing that happen even in the church. Uh, men are not taking the spiritual leadership in their family like they should. Gentlemen, it's time for us to step up. God chose us to be the spiritual leaders of our family. Amen. To lead them to the Lord and to teach them to love our God. In Proverbs 22 and 5, train up a child in the way that he shall go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from that. Whose job is it to do that? Mine as a father. I am to lead my children and raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of God. So they were supposed to be the spiritual leader, and that was a huge thing. And, and so Reuben had been placed in that position. Think about it. What a blessing that was to him. Should have been at least. Hey Amen. He would have been the richest of the sons, and then he would have been the spiritual leader when Jacob died. But he blew it. He blew it. He gave it all away. He, like Esau, gave it all away for nearly nothing. Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Hey Amen. And Reuben gave away the firstborn rights just for a one-night fling. The Bible said he went in to one of his father's concubines. And so lust overpowered Reuben. And he went into that concubine. And that one act of disobedience cost him dearly. It cost him a double portion. And it cost him the spiritual leadership of his family. And no doubt his family suffered greatly because of that. Oh, as I look at that, the devil used lust to bind Reuben and destroy him. I'm telling you this morning, he's doing the same thing in our generation. I was reading this last week where 60% of church men, hey man, think about this now, 60% of church men admitted to regularly looking at pornography. I'm thinking, you gotta be kidding me, man. You gotta to be kidding me, lust is eating them alive. Now that's only the ones that admitted to it. Think about that. There's probably way more that wouldn't admit to it. I'm telling you this morning that the devil is out to destroy us and he's headed for the Father first and he's going to use anything in his power to try to destroy us and lust is a very powerful tool in the hand of that enemy today. Think about that. And so he went in to his dad's concubine and he had sex with her, but he lost it all. Brethren, please do not let that happen to you. Guard your integrity. Guard your mind. David said, I'll set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Be careful what you look at. Be careful what you do. Be careful because the devil may be setting you a trap to destroy you. And if he can destroy you, he's going to destroy your family. Think about it. This is what thrills me, though. <laughs> Look who did receive Reuben's double portion. Woo! 
hallelujah. Who was it, Brother Hanks? Joseph. Man, that makes me happy. Why? Because it was Joseph, remember, who refused to commit adultery with Potiphar's wife. <laughs> she tried to seduce him, Brother Terry, and he wouldn't have anything to do with her, and he, he ran. But she got him by the coattail and ripped his coat off of him, but he left with his integrity. She had his coat, but he retained his integrity. Hallelujah. And because of her lies, he spent 13 years in prison for a crime he never committed. We look at that as a terrible thing, but God was putting iron in his soul. God was getting ready to bless this man who refused to be ungodly, who refused to allow lust to overtake him. And because he remained faithful to God and true to his word, God blessed him in an abundant way. Hallelujah. What happened to him? i tell you what happened. He got the, the blessing of the firstborn. He got the blessing of the firstborn. He got a double portion of the inheritance of Jacob. God blessed him for his integrity. I came by to tell you, gentlemen, that if you want to be blessed of God, then just remain faithful to the Lord. Amen. Pure in your heart and allow God to work in your lives and he will bless you abundantly. Not only did he give him, get a double portion, but he became the premier, the prime minister, if you will, of the greatest nation on the face of the earth in his generation and he literally saved the entire world. I cannot overemphasize the necessity of living a holy, righteous, godly and sanctified life as a man, as a father, as a husband and as a dad. Oh, listen, the benefits of that are unbelievable and if we'll do that, God will bless us and God will help us make a difference in this world. Wow, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Oh, yes. It's going to pay to live right, guys. It's going to pay to do what God wants us to do. He received the double portion, and he became the greatest leader he ever had. Second, for Judas, Ananias, and Sapphira, the devil used greed. The devil used greed. They made a choice. They chose money over Jesus. <laughs> they chose money over Jesus. Listen, the devil will get you and I so busy and so caught up in making money and having things and possessing things <laughs> that we don't have time for Jesus. Amen. Dad, if, if the devil ever gets you to that point where you're chasing a dollar instead of chasing Jesus, you're in trouble. Not only are you in trouble, your family's in trouble, your offspring are in trouble, your grandchildren are in trouble, your church is in trouble, your community's in trouble, and your nation's in trouble. God didn't call us to chase a dollar. He called us to chase him. Oh, I want to be a God chaser, don't you? I want to love him with all of my heart. It's the only way we can make a difference. Uh, hallelujah. Listen, Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 and 3, but fornication and all uncleanness uh, or covetousness, uh, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Uh, he's saying, look, in the church, uh, there should not be one person in your church that loves money more than me. Hallelujah. That's chasing a dollar instead of chasing me. Amen. Now that seems like a very harsh and, and very powerful admonition to, to us and it is. But there's a reason for that because what it leads to in Colossians 3 and 5 Paul says covetousness which is idolatry. You see gentlemen, when, when money becomes more important to us than our relationship with the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ, we literally then turn into an idolater. No, we don't have a shrine to Buddha and we don't bow down to some idol somewhere, but we become idolater. 
dollars because money then has become our idol. And, and Paul was saying, listen, don't ever let that be said among the saints of God. Oh, I'm telling you this morning that our relationship with the Lord is far more important than the bottom line in our bank account. Gentlemen, one day, they're not going to need your money. They're going to need your prayers. They're going to need you to touch God for them. Amen. And that is what's going to be more important than anything else in the world. So we need to be careful. And then finally for Lot, it was the world. Abraham was Lot's uncle. And God had called Abraham, remember, out of Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of promise, the land of Canaan. In, in some ways, not in every way, but in some ways that typifies heaven. Typifies heaven. He called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, which was a wicked, vicious, vile, ungodly society. He called him out of that to go into the land of promise. <laughs> Hallelujah. And God has called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. He's called us out of the world and he's preparing us, Brother Terry, to make it to heaven. Praise God. So there are similarities there. And uh, he told Abraham to go into this land that I will show you and that your seed will after receive for an inheritance. Uh, but then the Bible said, and Lot went with him. His nephew, Lot, went with him. Well, they got over there, and God began to bless them. Oh, honey, Abraham was a friend of God. Abraham, everywhere he went, but two places he built an altar, and God began to bless them, and he blessed him so much until the land couldn't hold both of them, and there, used, there got to be a little strife between the herdmen of, of Lot and the herdmen of Abraham because the blessings of God were overtaking them. Ooh, pour it on us, Lord. Amen. And so they had to make a decision. We got to split up here. Lot, you got to go one way and I got to go the other. But Lot, I'm going to let you choose. Think about that. Abraham trusted God that no matter where he went, it was going to be all right. I'm telling you, we're living in a time when a lot of people are afraid. A lot of people fear is gripping their heart. I'm telling you, our God is able to take care of us no matter what happens. He took care of us through COVID, through a pandemic. He'll take take care of us through a downturn, a recession, or a depression. Come on, say amen. David said, I was young once, and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. Oh, honey, if you live for God, God is going to take care of you. Ooh. So he said, go ahead, Lot, you choose, man. God will take care of me, what, whatever you want. Notice what he said, Genesis 13 and 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from from the other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, hear me, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. That's what struck me, Sister Shirley. And he pitched his tent towards Sodom. But not Abraham. Listen to Genesis 12 and 8. We read there, and he, Abraham, removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. Listen, and there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. <laughs> Ooh, hallelujah. Notice two things here. Number one, the Bible said Abraham pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west. What does that mean, Brother Hanks? Well, it's kind of interesting because Bethel means House of God. House of God. Where did Abraham pitch his tent? Close to the house of God. Ooh, he wanted to be close to church. And then notice second, not only did he pitch his tent close to the house of God, but in there he built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. Now I'm going to interpret that Hanks' way, okay? He didn't just want to go to church and be a member. He wanted to have a powerful relationship with God. I've been
been a little saddened at the role of some men in our churches. Sometimes we've relegated prayer meeting to the women. I'm preaching good. We let the women do all the fundraising. We let the women do all the praying. We let the women do uh, whatever, you know. And us men, we just go make a living and we chase a dollar instead of chasing Jesus. I can't hide. It should never be that way, gentlemen. Don't ever let that happen to you. If you do, you're gonna mess up. The devil's going to bind you. The devil's going to destroy your family. So Abraham built a law altar. He called on the name of the Lord. So here we have two very different men who made very different choices. Lot chose by sight and not by faith. Abraham said, it don't matter a lot. You choose whatever you want, honey. God will take care of me. I got enough faith. So Lot chose by sight and Abraham, or yes, by sight and Abraham chose by faith. Lot chose for wealth and not for the spiritual health of his family. Lot loved the world and the things that were in it, but Abraham loved God and Abraham wanted to do the will of God. Hear me now. Dad, you and I were either like Abraham or we're like Lot. We're either like Abraham or we're like Lot. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like Lot. I want to be like Abraham. And I want to camp out close to the house of God. And I want to have a prayer life. And I want to commune with God. And I want to know him and love him and worship him with all of my heart. And I want to teach my family to do the very same thing. You're going to either choose for wealth or you're going to choose for spiritual health. It's your choice. But be careful what you choose because our choices have consequences. Lot chose the world and and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. I don't know, but I just kind of believe in my mind that, that he was thinking, oh, well, I'm not going to live there. I know it's a wicked, ungodly place, but I'm not going to live in Sodom. I'm just going to live near it. Amen. And the devil will tell you, hey, 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 you, you know, you, no need to be so spiritual, no need to be so prayerful, don't worry about all that, you know. That, that, that world's got some stuff that you don't have to live in it now, but just get close enough to it, you know, where if you, if you want something, you can go get it, amen. But listen, Lot may have had good intentions in the beginning, but it didn't work out the way he thought it was gonna work out, did it, Brother Wayne? No, sir, because the next thing, the next time we read about Lot, he's not just living somewhere out in the suburbs close to Sodom, he's living in Sodom. Hey, man, not only is he living in Sodom, but he's, he's climbed the corporate ladder, if you will, and now the Bible said he was sitting in the gate of Sodom. You know what that meant? That meant that he had become one of the leaders of that whole place, hey, amen, because they ruled ruled in that day. The elders ruled from the gate of the city and so Lot didn't just move close to Sodom. He ended up in it and he didn't just end up in it. He ended up in the political realm of that and now he has become a ruler in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh honey, he, he wanted prestige. He wanted power. He wanted a, a, a place and a position there in that city. If we're not careful brethren that same lure and temptation will come to us. We'll want a prestige and we'll want power. Come on, say amen. We'll want position somewhere that God doesn't want us to be. I don't care about being the mayor of Pahokee or Mount Dora. I don't care about being the governor of, the, of Florida or the president of the United States. But what I do care about is I want a right relationship with God. I want to know him and love him and be ready if Jesus were to come at any moment to meet him 
him in the clouds of glory. That's what I worry about. Uh, hallelujah. If we're not careful, then that lure will get a hold of us. Uh, the lure of the world uh, and the things that are in it. Uh, and it'll ruin our relationship with the Lord. Listen, uh, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Moses chose uh, rather to suffer affliction uh, with the people of God uh, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin uh, for a season. Uh, and Moses knew in his heart that it wasn't worth it. Uh, and he left it alone. Uh, but it got a hold of Lot. Uh, and it cost him dearly. Think about it. Uh, he went close uh, uh, there. Uh, and uh, it cost him his family. But notice Abraham by contrast. Uh, he got close to Bethel. Pitched his tent there. He wanted to be in church. And he wanted to commune with God. Uh, and it, it paid off handsomely. Listen to me. Uh, church uh, and your prayer life, gentlemen, uh, should be the two most important things in your life. Uh, church uh, and your prayer life uh, should be your two most important things uh, in your life. Uh, so where are your priorities? Uh, are they in making money? Uh, are they in be having prestige uh, or uh, pertaining uh, and uh, power, obtaining power? Or is it in seeking and loving God? Uh, that's what we have to ask ourselves uh, here this morning. Lot chose the world, uh, but Abraham chose God. Uh, the choices they made affected their families uh, and the outcome of their families' lives. Uh, and gentlemen, the choices you and I make this morning uh, are going to affect our families and our lives uh, and the outcomes uh, down the road somewhere. We sang the chorus uh, and we talked about the blessing of God uh, upon a thousand generations. Uh, that's what I want. Uh, I want to pass down uh, a real faith uh, to the next generation. Uh, I want my children and grandchildren uh, to know God uh, and to love him and serve him uh, with all of their heart. That is what I want uh, and that will make me a success. Not how much money I make, not what kind of house I live in or car I drive. Amen. Did I or did I not live for God for me? And did I not pass that genuine faith down to my posterity and the generations to come? Oh, for Abraham, God blessed him abundantly. Listen, and through his ge genealogy and lineage came Christ. Think about that, came Christ. That's how much God blessed Abraham for. But Lot lost lost his family physically and he lost most of them physically and all of them spiritually and morally. Amen. See, at least two of Lot's daughters died in Sodom and Gomorrah. For the Bible said he went out and spoke to his sons in law, plural. So there was at least two more daughters. You know what? The Bible said he seemed as one that mocked unto them. Lot had lived so loose and had loved the world so much that his daughters and sons-in-law had no confidence in him at all. And they died and they perished in the judgment of God. I don't want to live that kind of life. And then his wife loved that world so much she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. So he lost her. And then the two other daughters that were left behind they got their father drunk and committed incest with him. So morally, Lot lost his whole family because he loved that world instead of loving Jesus and loving God. Gentlemen, let's love Jesus afresh and anew. Let's make him real to our families. Hallelujah. Let's take Paul's admonition in closing. Come on, Melody. In 1 Corinthians 16 and 13, I love this. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. And I looked at that. I said, yes, Lord. The words watch you, it means to be awake or alert or on guard. Gentlemen, we need to be awake and alert and on guard. Spirits should think about it. Then he said, second, to stand fast in the faith. It means to stand firm and persevere. Oh, if there's ever been a time we need to get a, a firm faith and stand on it and persevere, it's now. It's going to take that to be ready when Jesus comes. Then he said, quit you like men. The word quit is an old English word. It just, seems to, it just means to act like a man or be manly. Amen. We live in a generation where we're trying to feminize men. Feminize men. Amen. Listen, teach your boys to be men. Teach your boys to be manly. Come on, amen. The devil is doing the feminizing, not God. He said, be a man. Stand up and be a man. 
If we ever needed to teach our children, our young men to be men, it's now. Then he said, be strong. That literally means if you look at it in the Greek, it's in, a, it's in the present tense, imperative, and it means that it needs to be done constantly, but it literally means to grow stronger, to grow stronger. So Paul is saying, listen, listen guys, you need to be alert and awake and on guard. You need to have a firm foundation. You need to stand and persevere in the faith. You need to be a man. Be a man. Stand up and be manly. Amen. And you need to keep on growing. Keep on getting stronger and stronger and stronger in the Lord. <laughs> and if you will, everything going to be all right. Come on, everything going to be all right. Your family's going to be better. Your church is going to be better. Your community's going to be better. Your nation's going to be better. And the world's going to be better. So, gentlemen, you and I this morning, we have a chance to make a difference. I don't know about you, but I want to do my part. I want to do my part. The only way the enemy can spoil your house is to bind you, Dad. But if you refuse to be bound by lust, if you refuse to be bound by covetousness, and if you refuse to let that world have an influence on you, the devil cannot spoil your house. They will be overcomers. Stand with me. Father, I love you today. What an honor it's been to be here. What an honor it is to be a father this morning. What a great responsibility I feel on my shoulders, not only for my child, Lord, but for my grandchildren. Lord, for these children. You know how much I love every one of these young people here today, Lord. I love these men. I love these women, Lord. When our world's in a mess and the devil has an all-out attack against us, God, he's trying to destroy our families, but I pray this morning that you'll make us strong, God. I pray this morning, Lord, you'll make us stronger than we've ever been. Don't let the strong man bind us, Lord, but let the stronger than the strong man, Jesus, make us strong this morning. Help us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. Lord, strengthen every family in the Good Shepherd Church of God. Strengthen every family in this place, Lord. Make this community better because we're better men and stronger men. Make this community more spiritual because we're spiritual men and godly men, Lord. Oh, God, help us to glorify you in all that we say and all that we do. Help us not to be bound by anything, Lord, but loosed in the power of the Spirit to do the work of God in this last day. Help us now around this altar, Lord. Lay your hand on every one of us, Lord. I know I preach mostly to men today, but there's some people here that are hurting. There's some people here that have needs. There's some people here that came with a heavy heart. Lord, Father's Day brings mixed emotions because, Lord, this morning some of us don't have our dad. I don't have one. Lord, mine are gone, but thank you this morning, God, that you gave us a heavenly Father. And then others, Lord, they're sad like a wilderness, some of them, because they're dad is in trouble and they need a miracle and then others Lord they're happy because their dads are alive and they can still love them and they can still hug them and they can still tell them they love them Lord and so we come with mixed emotions but I pray you'll lay your hand on every one of us for you know every need and the cry of every heart touch us right now around this altar and we'll praise you for it in Jesus name amen amen the devil wants to destroy